So I'm just going to go through now, before returning to the broader picture, the actual process of money and credit creation, because I think it's really important that everyone understands that. Um, uh, and unfortunately, this is not something you will be taught most likely in your first or second year economics course. Um, it's just not seen as that important. I think it is extremely important. So this is a, a simplified bank balance sheet. Um, banks have, like any firm, assets um, from which they derive a flow of income and liabilities, uh, that is, um, what they owe to other people or other organisations. And the key thing is that those assets and those liabilities must at all times balance, um, otherwise the bank is in danger of either insolvency or not being uh, uh, li liquid. Um, so on a balance sheet you have loans, which we, we understand, you have deposits. We deposit money in the bank, as everyone knows. Um, but then you have some other types of assets and other types of liabilities. Um, and I'll talk about those shortly. Um, <coughs> where is money in this? Uh, well, it's here. Uh, a bank uh, deposit is money. Uh, and when a bank makes a loan, it creates, well, I'll, I'll show you what exactly what happens. Basically, you have money on uh, money as a deposit, and you also have money uh, as cash and central bank reserves. Now, the act of creating new money, first you sign a loan with the bank, and the bank creates a new asset. So that customer loan, the asset side expands, and at the same time, the bank credits your account with a new deposit. Um, now, that deposit is money. It's an IOU from the bank to you, uh, which you can use to, to pay your taxes, to buy the newspaper in your local shop, uh, to give to your friend if you owe them money. Um, but it is a bank IOU. Okay? It's, it's not anything else. It's a bank IOU. And of course, a bank's IOU is underwritten by the state. Um, so that's the, uh, the act of creating money. Both sides of the balance sheet have expanded, so they are even, um, uh, as I said before. Um, you then spend your money on whatever you borrowed it for. Uh, you buy a, a car or uh, you buy some, something else that you need. Um, that reduces the liabilities in your bank's balance sheet because they go to another bank. Okay? Uh, now, when you transfer your deposit, what happens is the bank, which has reserves with the central bank, transfers central bank reserves to settle your payment with that other bank. So essentially we have two circuits of money, it's the best way to think about it. We have uh, a circuit involving me and you and the, and the, uh, uh, the other uh, payees um, with, w for which we use bank IOUs to settle our payments. But there is another circuit involving commercial banks and the central bank. And commercial banks have to settle with each other via their account at the commercial bank using central bank reserves. Central bank reserves are basically electronic ca cash. They're equivalent to the notes that you pull out of the commercial bank, but they are used by commercial banks uh, to settle with each other. Um, now, at the end of the day, the bank has to replenish its reserves. So if it's had an out payment, pay another bank to help you buy your car, reserves will have moved over to that other bank, and that bank, your bank, will need to replenish its reserves to ensure it's uh, solvent. Uh, so it will do that by borrowing from other banks in the interbank market. <coughs> um, uh, and you've heard of the LIBOR, the LIBOR crisis. Uh, that's the London interbank market. That's what it stands for. It's banks borrowing and selling to each other those central bank reserves uh, to ensure they have sufficient liquidity at any one time. And of course, again, that additional borrowing on the interbank market increases the uh, liabilities of the bank. And again, the assets and liabilities are uh, even once more. Now, to make that a bit clearer, because I know it's a bit of a complicated thing, this is a, a visual that tries to represent what I've just been talking about. Essentially, um, this clearing process uh, happens, um, is, is, is represented in the top diagram here. This is the big sort of six banks in the UK. Um, they're clearing by swapping reserves with each other during the course of the day. Um, they also allow you to withdraw cash. Of course, you can withdraw, withdraw some of your electronic IOUs as cash. Um, 
that is also a function of the banking system. And then overnight, uh, those, those commercial banks trade with each other, buy and sell reserves with each other to make sure they've all got sufficient central bank reserves to maintain their liquidity, <coughs> essentially. Now, what the central bank does is it basically decides on the interest rate of those uh, central bank reserves in the uh, interbank market. Okay, so when, a, when, a bank, when the central bank raises interest rates, it's effectively raising the cost of funding for commercial banks to borrow those reserves from, one, uh, from each other um, in the course of a day or, 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 or overnight. Um, now, if it raises the co the idea is basically if it raises the cost of uh, those reserves, um, the commercial banks will pass on that cost to customers when they make loans. Essentially, so you raise the the interest rate, the the, the policy rate that you will hear about on the news by one percent. Typically, commercial banks will add that to the cost of borrowing your mortgage or your your credit from a, a commercial bank. And of course, by raising the cost, the idea is you deflate demand, because money costs more, you borrow less from uh, the bank, there's less money in the economy, inflationary pressures are reduced. And the opposite, if you cut interest rates, you encourage, again, that cut is passed on by the commercial banks to the public by the second circuit of money, and you increase the amount of money in the economy. That is the basis, basic idea of, of monetary policy. <coughs> How do banks become insolvent? Well, what happens is the loans that they've made are not paid back. And if enough of those loans are not paid back, uh, the result is, um, if, more, if, if more loans are not repaid, then the bank's equity capital down here, which Andy will talk about in more detail, this is essentially, capital is essentially the money that the bank holds onto in case loans default. Okay, so again, uh, because the amount of loans is, is larger than the bank's equity capital, you see the, the, the dotted line, that, that amount's larger, the bank will become insolvent. How do banks become illiquid? Well, in that case, uh, customers withdraw deposits at a faster rate than banks can sell their liquid assets, bonds, for example, that hold go government bonds or corporate bonds, um, which means the bank can't reduce its at the asset side of its balance sheet as fast as its the liability side of its balance sheet is falling, and if that happens, the bank will eventually become illiquid um, and be unable to continue. It won't be able to give out any more money to its customers, and it will essentially um, have to go into receivership. Uh, so that's, that's essentially how insolvency happens and how illiquidity happens, even though banks can create money, which is kind of an obvious question you might, you might sort of ask. Of course, people won't borrow from a bank if they think it's illiquid or insolvent, so the bank won't be able to create the new deposits it needs to fund itself. And no other bank either will accept payments from it if it has lost confidence in its, in, in its solvency or its liquidity. So you have this very strong pro-cyclical self-reinforcing dynamics uh, that can lead to this loss of confidence, which is what happened during the financial crisis. Now, Let's just go back to this credit theory of money that I talked about earlier with Schumpeter and, and Keynes's work. As I said, the main driver of lending in this scenario is confidence. Um, it's not to do with, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, fractional reserve banking is, is sort of uh, technically not a very good term to describe our, our system because it implies that banks can lend out some fraction of the reserves that they hold um, uh, the gold that they hold uh, in their accounts. Um, it used to be a bit more like that, but today we have what's called endogenous money. Essentially, a bank can create new money uh, without needing any savings or deposits. Uh, it actually creates the deposits in the act of, of lending. So it's endogenous in the sense that um, it's dependent on the confidence of the borrower, uh, more demand for money, and the confidence of the bank to lend, so the, the confidence of the bank in the, um, in the solvency of the borrower, okay? So um, it, it's driving the economy, or the economy is driving the, the lending. And again, this, this dichotomy between the real and the financial falls apart under that kind of approach. 
So capitalist systems are driven by endogenous credit-driven cycles, uh, and particularly they're driven by asset prices, because that rising asset prices, rising house prices, or uh, rising prices of, of other types of assets creates more confidence, leads people to demand more credit, leads banks to lend more credit, and vice versa when things go bad.